The Witcher, Part Six. Ostrid quickly regained consciousness and looked around in the total darkness. He noticed that he was tied up. He did not see Geralt standing right beside him, but he realized where he was and let out a prolonged, terrifying howl. Keep quiet," said the Witcher. "Otherwise, you'll lure her out before her time." You damned murderer! Where are you? Untie me immediately, you louse! You'll hang for this, you son of a bitch! Quiet. Ostrid panted heavily. You're leaving me here to be devoured by her, tied up? He asked, quieter now, whispering a vile invective. No, said the Witcher. I'll let you go, but not now. You scoundrel! Hissed Ostrid, to distract the Stringer. Yes. Ostrid didn't say anything. He stopped wriggling and lay quietly. Witcher. Yes. It's true that I wanted to overthrow Faltest. I'm not the only one, but I'm the only one who wanted him dead. I wanted him to die in agony, to go mad, to rot alive. Do you know why? Geralt remained silent. I loved Ada, the king's sister, the king's mistress, the king's trollop. I loved her. Witcher, are you there? I am. I know what you're thinking, but it wasn't like that. Believe me, I didn't cast any spells. I don't know anything about magic. Only once in anger did I say. Only once. Witcher, are you listening? I am. It's his mother, the old queen. It must be her. She couldn't watch him and Ada. It wasn't me. I only once, you know, tried to persuade them, but Ada, Witcher, I was besotted, and said, "Witcher, was it me? Me? It doesn't matter any more." Witcher, is it nearly midnight? It's close. Let me go. Give me more time. No. Ostrid. Did not hear the scrape of the tomb lid being moved aside, but the Witcher did. He leant over, and with his dagger cut the magnate's bonds. Ostrid did not wait for the word. He jumped up, numb, hobbled clumsily, and ran. His eyes had grown accustomed enough to the darkness for him to see his way from the main hall to the exit. The slab blocking the entrance to the crypt opened and fell to the floor with a thud. Geralt, prudently behind the staircase balustrade, saw the misshapen figure of the Strigger speeding swiftly and unerringly in the direction of Ostrid's receding footsteps. Not the slightest sound issued from the Strigger. A terrible, quivering, frenzied scream tore the night, shook the old walls, continued rising and falling, vibrating. The Witcher couldn't make out exactly how far away it was. His sharpened hearing deceived him. But he knew that the Strigger had caught up with Ostrid quickly, too quickly. He stepped into the middle of the hall, stood right at the entrance to the crypt. He threw down his coat, twitched his shoulders, adjusted the position of his sword, pulled on his gauntlets. He still had some time. He knew that the Strigger, although well fed after the last full moon, would not readily abandon Ostrid's corpse. The heart and liver were for her. Valuable reserves of nutrition for the long period spent in lethargic sleep. The Witcher waited. By his count, there were about three hours left until dawn. The cock's crow could only mislead him. Besides, there were probably no cocks in the neighborhood. He heard her. She was trudging slowly, shuffling along the floor. And then, he saw her. The description. Had been accurate. The disproportionately large head, set on a short neck, was surrounded by a tangled, curly halo of reddish hair. Her eyes shone in the darkness like an animal's. The Strigger stood motionless, her gaze fixed on Geralt. Suddenly, she opened her jaws as if proud of her rows of pointed white teeth. Then snapped them shut with a crack like a chest being closed, and leapt, slashing at the Witcher with her bloodied claws. Geralt jumped to the side, spun a swift pirouette.
The Strigger rubbed against him, also spun around, slicing through the air with her talons. She didn't lose her balance and attacked anew, mid-spin, gnashing her teeth fractions of an inch from Geralt's chest. The Rivian jumped away, changing the direction of his spin with a fluttering pirouette to confuse the Strigger. As he leapt away, he dealt a hard blow to the side of her head, with the silver spikes studding the knuckles of his gauntlet. The Strigger roared horribly, filling the palace with a booming echo, fell to the ground, froze, and started to howl hollowly and furiously. The Witcher smiled maliciously. His first attempt, as he had hoped, had gone well. Silver was fatal to the Strigger, as it was for most monsters brought into existence through magic. So there was a chance. The beast was like the others, and that boded well for lifting the spell, while the silver sword would, as a last resort, assure his life. The Strigger was in no hurry with her next attack. She approached slowly, baring her fangs, dribbling repulsively. Geralt backed away and, carefully placing his feet, traced a semicircle. By slowing and quickening his movements, he distracted the Strigger, making it difficult for her to leap. As he walked, the Witcher unwound a long, strong silver chain, weighted at the end. The moment the Strigger tensed and leapt, the chain whistled through the air and, coiling like a snake, twined itself around the monster's shoulders, neck and head. The Strigger's jump became a tumble, and she let out an ear-piercing whistle. She thrashed around on the floor, howling horribly with fury, or from the burning pain inflicted by the despised metal. Geralt was content. If he wanted, he could kill the Strigger without great difficulty. But the Witcher did not draw his sword. Nothing in the Strigger's behaviour had given him reason to think she might be an incurable case. Geralt moved to a safer distance, and without letting the writhing shape on the floor out of his sight, breathed deeply, focused himself. The chain snapped. The silver links scattered like rain in all directions, ringing against the stone. The Strigger, blind with fury, tumbled to the attack, roaring. Geralt waited calmly, and, with his raised right hand, traced the sign of Ard in front of him. The Strigger fell back as if hit by a mallet that kept her feet, extended her talons, bared her fangs. Her hair stood on end and fluttered, as if she were walking against a fierce wind. With difficulty... One rasping step at a time, she slowly advanced. But she did advance. Geralt grew uneasy. He did not expect such a simple sign to paralyze the Strigger entirely, but neither did he expect the beast to overcome it so easily. He could not hold the sign for long. It was too exhausting, and the Strigger had no more than ten steps to go. He lowered the sign suddenly and sprung aside. The Strigger, taken by surprise, flew forward, lost her balance, fell, slid along the floor, and tumbled down the stairs into the crypt's entrance, yawning in the floor. Her infernal scream reverberated from below. To gain time, Geralt jumped onto the stairs leading to the gallery. He had not even climbed halfway up when the Strigger ran out of the crypt, speeding along like an enormous black spider. The Witcher waited until she had run up the stairs after him, then leapt over the balustrade. The Strigger turned on the stairs, sprang and flew at him in an amazing ten-metre leap. She did not let herself be deceived by his pirouettes this time. Twice her talons left their mark on the Rivian's leather tunic. But another desperately hard blow from the silver-spiked gauntlet threw the Strigger aside, shook her. Geralt, feeling fury building inside him, swayed, bent backwards, and with a mighty kick knocked the beast off her legs. The roar she gave was louder than all the previous ones. Even the plaster crumbled from the ceiling. The Strigger sprang up, shaking with uncontrolled anger and lust for murder. Geralt waited. He drew his sword, traced circles with it in the air, and skirted the Strigger, taking care that the movement of his sword was not in rhythm with his steps. The Strigger did not jump. She approached slowly, following the bright streak of the blade with her eyes. Geralt stopped abruptly, froze with his sword raised. The Strigger, disconcerted, also stopped. The Witcher traced a slow semicircle with the blade, took a step in the Strigger's direction, then another. Then he leapt, feigning a whirling movement with his sword above her head. 
The Strigger, curled up, retreated in a zigzag. Geralt was close again, the blade shimmering in his hand. His eyes lit up with an ominous glow. A hoarse roar tore through his clenched teeth. The Strigger backed away, pushed by the power of concentrated hatred, anger and violence which emanated from the attacking man, and struck her in waves, penetrating her mind and body. Terrified and pained by feelings unknown to her, she let out a thin, shaking squeak, turned on the spot and ran off in a desperate, crazy escape down the dark tangle of the palace's corridors. Geralt stood quivering in the middle of the hall, alone. It had taken a long time, he thought, before this dance on the edge of an abyss, this mad, macabre ballet of a fight, had achieved the desired effect allowed him to physically become one with his opponent, to reach the underlayers of concentrated will which permeated the Strigger, the evil, twisted will from which the Strigger was born. The Witcher shivered at the memory of taking on that evil to redirect it, as if in a mirror against the monster. Never before had he come across such a concentration of hatred and murderous frenzy, not even from basilisks who enjoyed a ferocious reputation for it. All the better, he thought, as he walked towards the crypt entrance and the blackness that spread from it like an enormous puddle. All the better, all the stronger was the blow received by the Strigger. This would give him a little more time until the beast recovered from the shock. The Witcher doubted whether he could repeat such an effort. The elixirs were weakening, and it was still a long time until dawn. But the Strigger could not return to her crypt before first light or all his trouble would come to nothing. He went down the stairs. The crypt was not large. There was room for three stone sarcophagi. The slab covering the first was half pushed aside. Geralt pulled the third vial from beneath his tunic, quickly drank its contents, climbed into the tomb and stretched out in it. As he had expected, it was a double tomb for mother and daughter. He had only just pulled the cover closed when he heard the Strigger's roar again. He lay on his back next to Adder's mummified corpse and traced the sign of Irden on the inside of the slab. He laid his sword on his chest, stood a tiny hourglass filled with phosphorescent sand next to it, and crossed his arms. He no longer heard the Strigger's screams as she searched the palace. He had gradually stopped hearing anything, as the true love and Selendine began to work. Mm -hmm.